Well, good evening. Welcome to the 2021 Bender Lecture. We are back. Tonight's lecture honors doctors Eileen and Harvey Bender. Harvey Bender was a professor of biology at the University of Notre Dame for 52 years. He was founding director of the Regional Genetics Center at Memorial Hospital in South Bend and an adjunct professor um, of medical genetics at the Indiana University School of Medicine. Eileen Bender was a professor of English at IU South Bend for 33 years before retiring in May of 2010. She co-founded the statewide faculty colloquium on excellence in teaching at Indiana University, FACET, served as its first director and received many awards for her work at IU South Bend as a teacher and campus leader. Eileen and Harvey Bender were married in 1956 and had three children whose generous gift has made possible the Bender Scholar Lecture. Thank you so much to their children who are with us virtually tonight. I'd also like to thank the other contributors who made tonight possible, Linda Schultz Heydrich, who handled the logistics, Associate Dean Bill Ferry, who is running the webinar presentation, Molly Sullivan for support with fundraising, Demaray Dufour Nanaman, Sarah Brubaker, Interim Dean Jorge Muniz and all the event staff for helping us offer this lecture both in person and on Zoom. Emma Michelle Shedd and her staff who provided the reception appetizers available after Dr. Thomas's lecture here and after the question and answer period that we'll be doing. I wanna especially thank Associate Dean Dr. Lee Kahn who worked tirelessly and endlessly to make this night possible. I am now deeply honored to introduce Deborah Stanley who will introduce tonight's speaker Ms. Stanley has worked extensively with our Civil Rights Heritage Center and shares Dr. Thomas's passion for health equity. She's the founder and executive director of Imani Unidad, a not-for-profit organization in South Bend that unites social justice with social and behavioral health. Imani Unidad provides prevention, education, and advocacy through community efforts with an intentional emphasis on the black community. Please welcome Deborah Stanley. Ooh, it is truly an honor and a privilege to introduce to the South Bend community, the Indiana University South Bend 2021 Bender Scholar in Residence Lecture presented by Dr. Stephen B. Thomas and entitled The Colors of COVID-19 from Vaccine Hesitancy to Vaccine Confidence. Dr. Thomas is a professor of health policy and management at the University of Maryland School of Public Health where he also serves as director of the University of Maryland Center for Health Equity. In this role, he has become a true visionary and one of the nation's premier scholars in the effort to eliminate racial and ethnic health disparities. Dr. Stephen B. Thomas has applied his expertise to address a variety of conditions from which Black and Latinx community members generally face far poorer outcomes including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and HIV AIDS. When COVID-19 emerged as the latest threat to our health and well-being, naturally, he incorporated the challenge in his work. He is also a principal investigator with the National Institutes of Health, National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities through the Center of Excellence in Race, Ethnicity, and Health Disparities Research. Through this body of work, his expertise is grounded in minority health research and community-engaged interventions. According to Dr. Thomas, today we have the knowledge of how to prevent disease. When he looked at early death rates in the Black and Latinx communities, he surmised these deaths are premature. His research determined that the science of medicine and public health is not reaching everyone. The healthcare community could not continue to conduct business as usual. Thus, the impetus that spawned innovative approaches to the delivery of health information and research. The prevailing model at the Maryland Center for Health Equity is building bridges, building trust, and building healthy communities. 
The resulting strategies for Dr. Thomas became a mission to take the science of medicine and public health and translate it into community-based, culturally tailored interventions. The theoretical model became, take what we know what works and put it into practice. Dr. Thomas clearly understands the critical need for inclusion of diverse populations in clinical trials and research. As a result, an important strategy became the Maryland Community Research Advisory Board, commonly known as the Maryland CRAB. For the past eight years, grassroots community members sit and review research proposals that are trying to engage Black and Latinx community members. The resulting outcomes produce community members who have confidence in research and understand the importance of giving voice and bringing life to the needs, issues, and concerns of traditionally excluded communities. They understand that the knowledge, experience, and perspective about their people and their community has equal value and is a complement to the skills of the PhDs in the room. Dr. Thomas says our health cannot be simply treated as a medical problem. It must also be treated as a social and economic problem. Ubuntu, I am because we are. While Dr. Thomas clearly understands the historical context of mistrust and fear in the black and brown communities, he works diligently to arm the populace with accurate factual information from credible sources. More than a decade ago, Dr. Thomas and a team of Center for Health Equity researchers developed the Health Advocates in Reach and Research, H-A-I-R, HAIR campaign, which aims to create an infrastructure to engage salons and barbershops as sources for health education and medical services in a culturally tailored and community specific way. Hair builds upon the rich and powerful history of barbers and beauticians as trusted entrepreneurs providing essential services to the black community. Barbershops and beauty salons also represent high private sector, sector business partners dedicated to improving the quality of life in the neighborhoods they serve. Medical and public health research has proven that barbershops and beauty salons can be mobilized as venues for the delivery of health promotion and disease prevention services designed to eliminate health disparities and advance health equity. They serve as non-threatening environments for community members across the spectrum where any and everything can be discussed. Dr. Thomas has also been highly engaged in training programs which encourage the career development of minority scholars engaged in healthcare and research. At the National Research Mentoring Network, he continues to create the infrastructure for the next generation of scholars to know that they are worthy and they are supported. He believes as, as a teacher, you touch eternity. Therefore, by creating the opportunity for another person to excel in their excellence, they make the world better. Dr. Thomas is an invaluable, credible vault of information as demonstrated by the trove of research studies available to inform our work and decision-making right here in South Bend, Indiana. The first three titles that I'm going to read is Distrust, Race and Research, Health Disparities, the Importance of Culture and Health Communication, Personalized Strategies to Activate and Empower Patients in Healthcare, and reduce health disparities. Here we have the brilliant representative of the village in live and living color to impart on us his wisdom, truth, and humanity. So join me as I welcome to our community our newest family member, Dr. Stephen B. Thomas. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. What a wonderful introduction. And uh, I, I'm actually uh, quite touched of the homework that was done. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, what an honor to be here with you today. And I know that the other part of the lecture title is Scholar in Residence. So were it not for the pandemic, I'd be there with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm already disappointed I'm going to miss out on the treats afterwards. But at any, way, uh, at any rate, South Bend, uh, welcome and thank you for 
honoring me uh, with the opportunity to share with you the lessons that we're learning. And it's unfortunate that it has taken a pandemic to expose what many of us have already known, but that's indeed what it did take to bring the issues from the margins to the mainstream. And if there was ever an opportunity for transformative change, it is right now. This is a 100 year event. It will not be another 100 years before we have another virus new to the human race uh, that takes to, on the form of a pandemic. It will not be another 100 years. So we need to prepare now. So here we are uh, with masks and social distance. I mean, you got to take a picture of that audience because at one point we'll look back and say, what was going on in America at, at this time? And what's going on is we're saving ourselves. And at the same time, we're realizing that like when the pandemic first started, don't you remember when people said, we're all in the same storm? Remember that? It's a pandemic. Uh, black and brown people aren't dying because they're black and brown. It's because of underlying conditions translate health disparities. But you know what we realize now is that we may all be in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Some people are in yachts. Some people are in speed boats and cruise liners. And some people are in inner tubes. And some have been left to fend for themselves. And if we want to like one another on the other side of this, we need to figure out how to ensure that we leave no one behind. So again, thank you so much for that introduction, the opportunity to be here today. I'm gonna to take a chance here and show some slides. And for all you scholars out there, cross your fingers. I'm so old, I remember when we used rotary dial to make a phone call, okay? Uh, but I'm learning this Zoom space and I'm hoping that I can make this transition work and uh, Lee, you, you'll do thumbs up for me uh, to make sure that we have a full screen. And uh, how about right now? You see that side? Thumbs up? Full screen? Very good. So um, I asked myself, who are the benders? And I just learned about them. I actually incorporated into my slide deck their story. And it was just read to you. I, I found their photo. And I'm so honored that there are members of the family out there in the audience. I want the young scholars to know this is how you pay it forward. This is how you leave a legacy. And uh, the Academy is a beautiful place for that to happen. So uh, once again, I'm honored to be uh, in the family. I actually feel like I'm part of your South Bend family now and to be at your 2021 um, Bender Lecture. I've titled this uh, The Colors of COVID-19 from Vaccine Hesitancy to Vaccine Confidence. And if we had, if I was there and doing some interaction, uh, Lee, I'd say, uh, does everybody know who this is? This was drawn uh, by one of our undergrads during the 50 year anniversary of the March on Washington. And I've kept it in my slide deck ever since. And I do that because every year, my freshman class is like 18. And every year I'm older. And I'm now encountering students, Lee, that don't know who this is. And you have to realize that around the country, uh, what people are learning about American history, about the civil rights movement may well vary. And we have many students coming from around the world and faculty from around the world where they may not have the, the African-American history as part of what they learn about the United States. So I think we have to keep in front of us how we have made this a more perfect democracy, how we have made our country more inclusive. Yes, we have a ways to go, but we have shown a way forward. Everybody's counting on us to get this right. And that's what they can't believe. We have produced a vaccine in what can only be described as miracle time, miracle time. The other vaccine, I think it's measles, was four years. They just announced today a, a, a vaccine for malaria, 30 years. We did this in a matter of months. 
the fact that we cannot get this vaccine into the arms of the American people is why we're talking today. The broken parts of our public health infrastructure have been exposed. The broken parts of our healthcare delivery system have been exposed. The, the, the putting a life-saving vaccine on the end of the internet and expecting everyone to have access has been exposed as not working. Winston Churchill used to say, if I got the quote right, Americans always do the right thing after they've tried everything else. I think we're trying everything else. We're letting public health become politicized. Uh, we, we, in parts of the country, if you wear a mask, that means you're a certain political party. It is, it's hard to wrap your head around. And I'm hoping that we have a robust discussion here. Maybe you can help me. I don't expect that we're gonna agree on everything. These are complex issues, but I hope we can agree. Uh, and even when we disagree, that we're not disagreeable with one another. And so uh, thank you for the, uh, indeed, the motto of our Center for Health Equity, building bridges, building trust, building healthy communities. And around the images you see here are the examples of the programs that we have launched, um, scaled, and demonstrate that community-engaged research can not only uh, produce the kind of scholarship we expect of our faculty and our graduate students, undergrad students, uh, but also actually improve the quality of life of the people who live in the shadow of our buildings. I'm going to focus on that uh, box in the upper right, the Barbershop Health Initiative, as one of the examples that I'll talk about this evening. But I also want to point out that mission of mercy there. I know you're a basketball school. We took our basketball arena and put in 125 dental chairs. We went from oral hygiene to oral surgery with 3D printers producing permanent crowns. We served a thousand people over two days. Lee, they slept outside overnight to hold their place in line. Hey, young scholars, it wasn't a big concert. I know you kids do, the, you young people do that for tickets to concerts. These people were lined up sleeping outside overnight to get dental care. Now, if you've ever had a toothache, you know the kind of pain that puts you in, okay? I wanna talk about how, I, we do not have a dental school on our campus. We do not have a medical school on our campus. I want the young scholars to know that some things that they may be told are impossible are actually possible. If you focus on serving the needs of others and, and alleviating human suffering. Uh, we just released our uh, report, uh, Recovering from COVID-19 in Prince George's County. Our, uh, Prince George's County is of almost 1 million people. It's 60% African-American, 20% Hispanic, um, uh, significant immigrant populations. We are a majority minority county. And here's the other distinction, we're the wealthiest majority black municipality in the United States. And yet that did not protect us from the ravages of COVID. Prince George's and Baltimore City uh, and even Montgomery County are right up top in terms of driving the numbers here in the state. Our report, uh, you see the four major recommendations and in our discussion, we may talk about how these recommendations can help us make the transition from a focus on a chronic, uh, uh, focus on an infectious disease to recognizing that we must also address the health disparities that existed even before COVID took over our lives. Um, this is one of our uh, scientific products from our research uh, with the NIH. And that is an online interactive website called Building Trust Between Minorities and Researchers. We're working to raise the funds now to update this website with COVID information. But uh, it is a resource that you have available to to uh, your faculty and students in your community right now. And um, it includes uh, uh, the training modules. We'd love to be have a formal partnership with uh, Indiana University South Bend on enhancing minority engagement in research. You'll see there are five modules there for the community. It's designed for the community, but the development with community collaboration. And the other side of the coin, the researcher, the health professional, on becoming a self-reflective researcher, successfully engaging minority communities. And we have seven modules there. So maybe we'll have a chance to, uh, to talk about how 
how this can help prepare your faculty, your student body uh, for the kind of innovative out of the box um, interventions that we're gonna talk about tonight. So uh, Lee, I had a lot of uh, COVID epidemiology slides. I took them all out. Uh, we've all been in rooms where we go over and over the problem and we always run out of time for the solution. And so let's assume that COVID is real. It's not a hoax. It is a pandemic. And if we're going to understand how to get out of it, it means understanding the social context that drives health disparities in the United States. And ultimately, the aim must be to uncover the social, cultural, and environmental factors beyond the biomedical model and address a broad range of issues. This approach includes, but is not limited to breaking the cycle of poverty, increasing access to quality healthcare, eliminating environmental hazards in homes and neighborhoods, and implementing effective prevention programs tailored to specific community need. You can no longer just pull a brochure off the American Cancer Society shelf and put it in Spanish and say, okay, this is for the Latinx community or pull that brochure off the American diabetes shelf and put a black face on it and say, that's for the black community. We literally have to go hyper-local, hyper-local. What is the history of that community, that neighborhood, that zip code, that census tract and tailor from the ground up? And if we want this young scholar's life to be better, not only do we listen to Martin Luther King and the lessons of the civil rights movement, we also need to listen to the voices of in the, from the past, and that's Frederick Douglass. Yes, this statue is on our campus <laughs> in front of Hornbake Library, and it's called Freedom Square. Frederick Douglass said, and I'll quote, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men and women who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters, end quote. Do you hear the awful roar out there? That awful roar that we have not gotten COVID under control? Okay, yeah, the Delta, we're on the downslope. Do you know how many people died before we started on the downslope? Every one of those deaths, preventable people, we're over 700,000 dead, and we still have pockets in our country that don't believe this is real. That's the roar, of the awful roar of the many waters. We cannot avoid dealing with the politics that's out there, but there are ways to do that that save lives rather than further confuse and distract from what we know works. So let's begin here. Um, We've all been in academic rooms where we'll spend the entire workshop on definitions. I'm hoping that we can finally agree on a definition and then go get to work. <laughs> and so let's, let's recognize that words do matter, okay? Definitions do matter. And while some reflect stylistic preferences, others convey values and beliefs that can be explicitly or implicitly to, used to justify or promote particular views, policies, and practices. And so when you see the uh, racial and ethnic health disparity reports come out, instead of disparities, they say differences. That is a subtle but important distinction. We're not just talking about differences. When it comes to health disparities and health equity, we're talking about health disparity is a particular type of health difference that is closely linked to social, economic, and environmental disadvantage. That's what a health disparity is. It's not just a statistically significant difference. It's a difference caused by inequality in our society. Health equity is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. So you can look at your own uh, statistics there in the state of Indiana, and you will find where you have the best uh, life expectancy for children born. You'll find the best control of chronic disease wherever that neighborhood is, and, you, and we have all the maps to show you where it is, everyone should be able to attain that level of health. That's what health equity is about. And that might mean you have to do extra for certain groups that for whatever reason are suffering the burdens of race and history. So health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. 
And for the purpose of measurement, I know we have some statisticians out there, some evaluators out there. Here's what I want to tell you about the uh, measurement. Health equity means reducing and ultimately eliminating disparities in health and its determinants that adversely affect, here we go, excluded or marginalized groups. There's the key. So if an effort doesn't address poverty, doesn't address a discrimination or the health damaging consequences for groups of people who have historically been excluded or marginalized, it is probably not health, a health equity effort. So when you walk into a room focused on health equity and you don't see anybody around the table or in the room who represents, who comes from the excluded or marginalized groups, that's the moment for self-reflection. How do we fix that? History also matters. And this is a collage of examples of research abuse that are familiar to many of you. I'm sure you all know about the Tuskegee Suffolk experiment. The official name now is the US Public Health Service syphilis study done at Tuskegee. It is the classic example of uh, research abuse in all of the newspaper reports about vaccine hesitancy in minority communities, particularly the black community. Tuskegee is used as the example as to why. And I'm gonna to talk to you tonight about how we need to reframe uh, uh, and contextualize Tuskegee in the context of, health, of, um, of the pandemic. The other point is that um, these, these atrocities are no longer limited to um, books. They're movies. Miss Everest Boys is an HBO movie. There's a movie about Henrietta Lacks and the immortal life. I mean, now it's in the popular culture. So academics out there, we can't control now what's in the popular culture and the, and the artistic freedom that a movie director might make. We cannot rely on these to be the source of all the factual information, but we, but what we must do is realize that in many of the communities we come into, this is how they have been informed about these events. And we need to be sensitive to that. They may not be able to cite the total details about Tuskegee, where and when, but they know something bad happened back then. And they know from their grandmother and word of mouth that you can't always trust people showing up in white coats saying that we're here to help you. You have to be wary. And what we have to do is not disarm people because their fear, their distrust is legitimate. It has been earned. Now, this is a photo from the archives of the Tuskegee study. And you can see this physician, the white physician, uh, drawing blood literally out in a cotton field. Isn't that meeting people where they are? Actually, back then, they pioneered how to, how to reach people, how to build local coalition. It was an amazing demonstration of many of the things we talk about today. They work with local ministers to get them on board. They work with the plantation owners to get them on board. And they told the men in the Tuskegee study they would fix their bad blood. Now, bad blood, you know what bad blood is? They didn't think that people would understand what a spirochete was. Have you ever not wanted to, uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask my young scholars out there, you can raise your hand. Have you ever, uh, when the alarm goes off, you didn't wanna get out of bed, raise your hand. Come on now, be honest with me. Raise your hand out there. Okay. <laughs> you ever had a headache, just that rundown feeling? Okay. People saw that as bad blood. There was nothing stigmatizing about it. So when the doctor showed up to say, we have a, treatment for bad blood, they lined up in droves. But they were never told they had syphilis. Never told they had syphilis. On May 16, 1997, President Bill Clinton issued a formal apology. Think about this, 1932 to 1972, 40 years, the longest non-therapeutic experiment on humans in the history of medicine and public health. It was not until 1997 there was a formal apology. And this is Mr. Herman Shaw. And I was honored to be invited to the White House for this ceremony uh, based on the work that Dr. Quinn and I had done around the legacy of Tuskegee and its implications for HIV AIDS. Remember that, the AIDS epidemic? That's, I was 
I was uh, a young assistant professor when, when that all broke out. And, and here we are again with another infectious disease. Be mindful, we have no vaccine for HIV, okay? And you can count the years. One of the things that the scientists did, they used social science research, anthropologists in particular, that went to down south to interview and un try to understand the culture of the people. And one of the things they found out was that for many poor black, uh, black people living in the rural south, in this case, Macon, Alabama, their, one of their biggest fears was, was not being buried decently. And so the researchers actually use that information to come up with incentives for getting the uh, participants to agree to an autopsy. The men didn't know what an autopsy was. And for many of them, it would have been quite frightful to think that their bodies would be opened up at death. So burial insurance, okay? They use the information to do what? to empower the men to make informed decisions or to get those men to do what the researchers wanted them to do. That's the challenge we have. The Tuskegee study was never a secret. It was never a secret, but they published their results in medical journals with titles like 20 year retrospective of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. What you need to know is that it was not the medical community or the public health community that stopped the study. It was journalism. When these stories ran in the newspaper, July of 1972, the study was still going on. It was still going on. Only after public outcry did it stop. And now we're living today uh, in the shadow of Tuskegee as we address health disparities, COVID, you name it. There's a lesson here for us. And one of those lessons is related to the fact that the cultural memory in these communities. I'm giving you examples from the, from the black community. I could, if we had more time, we'd have examples from the Latinx, Native American, uh, even the early immigrants that arrived to the United States before they became white. Any of my Irish friends out there, just know when your ancestors arrived on the boat, they were not white when they arrived. <laughs> That's a whole nother story of how the, how the immigrants who we now look uh, you know, how the, how the Caucasian so-called race came to be. But this cultural memory is real. And I'm going to show you um, what the Ad Council is trying to do to reframe Tuskegee. Now, be mindful, for 40 years, those men were not given treatment, even when penicillin became available. And the federal government used all of its powers to ensure the men were not treated. For the first time in American history, they sent a list of names to every public health department in the country and said, if these men show up, don't treat them. They're in the Tuskegee study. Don't forget, 1932 to 1972. Hey, there was a world war that took place. <laughs> People were drafted. And if you were drafted, the first thing you had to do was have a physical. Lee, to the draft boards, they gave the list. If any of these men show up, do not treat them. So how do we reframe Tuskegee in the context of the COVID pandemic when so many African-Americans are hesitant? And if you read the newspaper, um, you see examples of, oh, they're hesitant because of the history of Tuskegee. Well, I'm going to take you to Tuskegee right now and let you meet uh, one of the grandchildren nieces and nephews of the survivors. Now, I really need your help here. I really need some fingers crossed as I go back in to share the screen. And I want you to tell me, uh, do you see uh, full screen, Lee? Yep, okay. Okay, here we go. Buckle your seatbelts. My uncle. Freddie Lee Tyson was a part of the syphilis study. He was such a wonderful man, a very loving, very caring, very jovial person. 
He helped build the air base at Moton Field. When you think about the Tuskegee Airmen, all of the greatness that they did, and then in this same space, such an atrocious study was being heaped upon our men. That really shook my spirit. They were not being treated. That is very different from what's happening with COVID-19. The vaccine is being made available to anyone who wants it, even those who find themselves at the space of hesitancy. We have to have patience and give them the requisite information that they need, that they can make an informed decision. But let's do it out of love. Did you hear that? Let's do it out of love. So when I see people fighting on airplanes over masks, I see people getting into fights with um, waitresses and bartenders in a, in a restaurant. Come on, people. That's not who we are. And the folks in, in, in Macon County, Alabama are saying, don't use the suffering of our ancestors as your excuse for not being vaccinated. Because in Macon County, Alabama, even though the state of Alabama as a state lights up as a, an unvaccinated state, in Macon County, they are vaccinated. That's the message. Now, if I asked the audience to raise their hands if they've seen that ad, I wouldn't be surprised, Lee, if no hands go up. You saw the quality of that production. That's high end. That's, that's broadcast. Uh, that's the ad council. Um, I don't know if they're running it at 3 a.m. in the morning or when, but the raw material is there to help move the needle. I want you to see how you can make sure that your communities understand that the real legacy of Tuskegee in the context of COVID is to make sure we do everything within our power to get people vaccinated. And I'm going to share with you how we're trying uh, to do that. I'm switching back, Lee. Here we go. Did I get back through the slides okay? Okay, my friend. And so after the atrocities of Tuskegee, uh, there were new ethical responsibilities in the aftermath. Um, and in 1978, uh, the Belmont Report. So anyone out there in the audience who's doing any human subject research, even a focus group, you got to go through the IRB. Well, that is a direct result in the, of the aftermath of the Tuskegee study. Of the, CIF, of the U.S. Public Health Service CIFA study done at Tuskegee. Uh, if you say it that way, people will know that you got it right and, you, and you've had good, good education and, um, and uh, you won't offend the people in Tuskegee who feel as if the original name and how it's characterized in the newspaper casts aspersion on the institution. It was the federal government who conducted the research. So the Belmont Report, we literally live by this very day. Respect for persons, that's why you have to have informed consent. Beneficence, that's why you have to make sure that the risk of the research does not outweigh the benefits. And we spend a lot of time on number one and two, but there's a third principle, justice. Justice says that those who bear the burden, those who bear the burden of research should not be denied the, the benefit. So it's, it's basically like that you can't go uh, to, to the Congo in Africa and test your new cancer drug, find it to be a blockbuster, and then only market it in wealthy Western countries. Those who bear the burden of research should not be denied the benefit. That's justice. Now let's apply that to health disparities. Those who bear the burden of disease should not be denied the benefit of the science we now have to actually treat and prevent that disease. We have to be much more intentional um, in engaging the populations falling through the cracks. And COVID, the pandemic has now, like a laser, exposed all of those cracks. So justice is about the goods of society. And Lee, I'm hoping that we are able to talk about the common good, the common good and the importance of the common good. So um, just unmic yourself and give me an idea how we're doing on time.
We're doing good, Stephen. You okay. keep, keep going. Great. Okay. Okay. Here we go. So, so uh, again, the, the research is clear. Um, I'm going to take you to a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they had an array of patients. These are the black male and female patients. And these are the white male and female patients. And the way the study was designed, they gave them all the same kind of medical history. You know, the men's medical history, the white man's medical history matched the black man's medical history and vice versa. And, uh, you know, it's not uncommon to have people say, I don't see race. I, I look at the data. I, I look at the results of the, of the health uh, status outcomes. And what this study demonstrated was that race did matter. And the last, the, the, the person in this array most vulnerable to that bias is the African-American woman. She was least likely to have the referral for a cardiac catheterization. Cardiac catheterization save lives, people. You may know folks out there who've had it. Why should there be a difference in the racial makeup of who gets cardiac, uh, a cardiac catheterization assessment simply based on the color of their skin? So the Institute of Medicine looked at these things and, it's called, and they recognized that, that it is not actively being racist but there is implicit bias going on that results in a racist outcome. And you might say, well, Dr. Thomas, that, was, that study was published in 1999. Well, let me take you fast forward to 2020. Remember her? Susan Moore, Michigan, physician, got COVID, ends up in the hospital, no white coat, no stethoscope, just a black woman in the hospital bed. How she was treated made her pull out her phone. This may well be our new truth and reconciliation device. She pulled out her phone and FaceTimed what was going on with her, posted it online and went viral. Okay? She died. She died. This is happening right now it's time to do better. And in Maryland, that's what's happening. Just this past legislative session, we have passed a law, public health implicit bias training and the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities. The law requires healthcare professionals to receive implicit bias training in order to renew their licenses. And you see the date there. I want you to get ready for the fights that are coming around this kind of, of uh, legislation and regulations because it's gotten caught up in the politicalization of public health. I need you to be ready. We need this kind of training, not just for people of color, for everyone. So as I head to the finish line, I'm calling for a warp speed of community engaged research. Don't you remember when we talked about warp speed? What did they say? They said, no one cut any corners uh, in terms of the science. We just got rid of a lot of the red tape and a lot of the rate and a lot of the, the bottlenecks. And here's what else, uh, Lee, they did. We, the taxpayers, we paid the pharmaceutical companies in advance before they developed anything. Remember that? And then we paid them for the market so they didn't have to compete with one another. I, and look what happened. We got a vaccine in record time that is safe and effective. The fact that we can't get that vaccine into the arms of all of our people, we should be ashamed. How is the country that created the vaccine in record time unable to vaccinate its own people? So think of it like this. On the STEM side, the scientists in the lab did their job. But look at the help they got to do that job. On the public health side, where public health departments and local health departments, public health departments have been stripped and of their budgets year after year after year. Then the pandemic hits. <laughs> They're stretched. They don't have capacity. And it's now obvious that we need to rebuild that infrastructure. And so in 2011, we published toward a fourth generation of disparities research to achieve health equity. 
And part of it was to recognize in terms of the training of our young scholars is that first generation research documents the problem. That's your surveillance statistics, your um, documentation, trends and patterns. You never have to leave your office to do that. You, you can do this with a good data set. Second generation explains the reasons for the disparities. Oh, low levels of education. They live in a food desert. Again, you don't have to leave your office. You have a good data set. You can see these relationships. Third generation disparities research is providing solutions for limiting disparities. That's the randomized clinical trials. Do you know how many randomized clinical trials we've run that show that it works? And yet the solution just lives in our medical and public health journals. Unacceptable. So think about this one. In 2018, a cluster randomized trial of blood pressure reduction in black barbershops. Do you know this was hugely successful? They actually demonstrated they could control blood pressure. Blood pressure is a leading cause of death, hypertension, leading cause of death in the black community, in stage renal disease, all kinds of consequences come from hypertension. 2018. Why isn't this being scaled around the country? I'm challenging you to take what we know and start implementing it. If we're ever gonna rebuild trust with the communities that live in the shadow of our buildings. And so this is our model, it's called uh, HEART, Health Equity Action Research Trajectory. Uh, it builds on first, second, third generation research and says, right now, the focus is to train fourth generation scholars who take action, who take it out of the books and put it into practice and recognize that the community is an important partner. Health equity is the lens. We must address race and the structural determinants of health. And so now I'm gonna take you into the neighborhood so you can see what this actually looks like. Um, in terms of our implementation, uh, that cultural tailoring actually does matter. And it was 20, uh, 2001 when the federal government launched Take a Loved One to the Doctor Day. I thought that was such a great campaign, great campaign. But then we realized that many of the people in the communities that we work didn't have doctors. They didn't have a medical home. And so we took a fourth generation approach and turned it on its head and we called it Take a Health Professional to the People. This is how this whole thing all started. And so when you see this scene here, you say, oh, that's really interesting. Uh, this is a young pharmacist, a young assistant professor with her dean, a pharmacy in the barbershop. And this particular setting was uh, in Pittsburgh where we started here. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, Dr. Krobuff and her group uh, uh, were inspired to start a community-based pharmacy program, recognizing that pharmacists know how to talk to people. They don't just distribute pills behind a desk. And they love this program, and it has grown over time to become a national model. And so um, uh, let me, let me uh, take you into a shop. And I'll just say this, Lee, uh, don't do this at home alone. If you're driving home and you drive by a black barber shop, say, I'm going to go in there and start a health campaign. Well, let's work together. <laughs> Get ready. And so... Let me take you inside. And, and Lee, I got to tell you, I got to tell uh, my, my friend something, uh, especially my white friends. No self-respecting black barber or stylist would ever say, I'll get you in and out in 15 minutes. And Lee, it doesn't matter how much hair you have. <laughs> You're going to be there half a day catching up on the sports, sharing what's going on in your life. I am telling you, it's an eye opener. And I'm going to take you inside right now. Okay, here we go. Buckle your seat belts out there. Um, Lee, did that change? Yes, we saw John Hopkins come up. Okay, and do you have a... a, a Image with a man having clippers at his head? Yes. Okay, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, buckle your seatbelts. The barbershop is a sacred space for the kinds of conversations we need to have to move people from 
vaccine hesitancy to vaccine confidence. Well, when Dr. T first came to me, he made me realize that we are more than just barbers because of the relationships that we have with our clients. Getting the right information to them from behind my chair is a definite way of giving back, is helping the community. Mike sent me a flyer. He said, hey, Dr. T, this is information being distributed in our communities. And the flyer said, COVID's a hoax. Don't take the vaccine. Our communities were marinating in misinformation. I tell them, you know, I, I can understand your concern. Don't disarm yourself. Do your research and make a decision that's going to benefit the well-being of your family and the other loved ones around you. And on May 17th, in Mike's shop, we did the first barbershop vaccine clinic, needles in arms, anywhere in the state of Maryland. It was just awesome to see the people coming in and rolling up their sleeve and taking the position to be vaccinated. I was excited. And now I think the barbershop and salon in the Black community is recognized as a legitimate place for engaging a population in health promotion disease prevention. So I've been ecstatic. And if you can give a life-saving injection of a vaccine in the barbershop, why can't we give the flu shot there? Why can't we give the diabetes test there? Why can't we do tele-wellness there? That's the vision. I am telling you, uh, that was Mike Brown there. Give Mike Brown some some snaps. Come on. I'm going to show him this video and say, we were in South Bend, Indiana, <laughs> and they got to see you in action. <laughs> and so why not go where people already have trust? Um, Lee, did it switch okay? Back to the slides? We're good. Yep. And so for the past uh, 15 plus years, our research has focused on just that. Uh, um, uh, we look for wicked problems. Some people run from wicked problems. We look for them and we run to them. You know what a wicked problem is, don't you? A social or cultural problem that's difficult or impossible to solve for many reasons, as you can see here, incomplete or contradictory information. Are we not living through that right now? The number of people and multiple opinions evolved. The large economic burden and the fact that complex problems are typically offloaded to policymakers are written off as too big and cumbersome to solve. We run to these kinds of problems. And our problem that we focused on was colon cancer and the fact that black people were dying before their time because of late detection of colon cancer. And so we focused on addressing early, um, early screening, age appropriate screening, colonoscopies. And just so you know, it's not the barber uh, telling you uh, what a colonoscopy is. It's the gastroenterologist. So we bring the medical professionals into the space. They're the ones delivering the medical information. They're the ones doing the screenings. The barbers make it okay. They make it okay. They make it normative. And in our shops now, it's, it's common to have conversations about screenings and and, and other kinds of health promotion activities. And so when you see, uh, this was a spread done by one of the insurance companies, the doctor is in, it's not, this is Fred, Fred, Fred uh, Spry there. It's not Fred playing doctor, it's Fred making his barbershop a place where doctors can come and engage his clients. That's what this is all about. And so as you can see here, uh, in these images, and I say this because, again, uh, um, Dr. King used to say that Sunday mornings was the most segregated time in America because we were all segregated in different churches. Some of that still may be true, but I'll tell you for surely, when you go get your haircut, depending on where you go, it, it can also be one of the most segregated times. Um, but as, as, as the introduction that was given uh, about this work, the barbers and stylists have been around since slavery time. Uh, they are very important entrepreneur, entrepreneurs in the history of this country. And we're discovering them now as a, as a partner in our effort to address 
uh, racial and ethnic health disparities. And uh, we've taught the barbers with our school of journalism how to use their cameras to do um, uh, client in the chair interviews, to ask questions and to use the actual authentic feedback from the community to develop our education programs. And uh, 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 this is our barbershop health box that was again developed by one of the, uh, the, the students doing internships. It looks like a, a mailbox is wrapped in a barber pole. You just drop your question in on an index card. The barbers can do it, the clients can do it. We pick up the information, we, 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 uh, we, uh, uh, we pick up the mail and then we turn their questions into infographics and post it on Instagram because that's where they get their information. They're not going to the CDC, the NIH, or the National Heart Blood Lung Institute. They're going to Instagram. And so we need to meet them again where they are and guide them in ways that provide them with the information they need and have the confidence that when people have the information they need, the knowledge they need, they will naturally gravitate towards saving their own lives. Uh, here we are demonstrating a. FDA approved COVID saliva tests. We did the first ones, Lee, in barbershops and salons, demonstrating that it works. And yet today, today, people are having a hard time finding where can I get tested? I'm sure they can get tested on your campus. I'm talking about out in the community. People are coming back saying they're charging me $120. They're charging me, you know, whatever. But in Europe, my friend, you can walk into a pharmacy and get a rapid test, $1 or one euro, okay? We need to get there. That way people know their status. The new treatments coming on, Merck just announced a new, um, uh, just like, like Tamiflu, you take it early in the flu and it will reduce the symptoms. Well, there's gonna be an oral version for COVID, but you have to what? You have to take it early in the disease process. You need to know your status. So you can see some of the icon images we have here. Um, as the barbers go through their training, they, they become um, uh, wellness warriors. Um, we are working with the National Association of County and City Health Officials, NACHO, uh, to connect them with their local health department. Um, when they go through our training, and uh, here in the state of Maryland, we're able to, the state of Maryland has accepted our training as equivalent and we have our first three barber stylists as certified community health workers, certified community health workers. That makes them eligible for insurance reimbursement. And I have them deployed right there in the barbershop where they do their work. Let's talk about reimagining how we deliver care, reimagining how we do care coordination, because I think many health professionals have no idea there are people in the community with this kind of influence that can influence their clients to adhere to the doctor's orders or influence them in ways where they won't. I've seen it in real time. And so we've launched Maryland Barbers and Stylists United for Health. And Leah, wouldn't I love to have Indiana Barbers and Stylists United for Health? Come on now, launch right there from South Bend. We can make that happen. And uh, this is Katrina and Mike uh, and their certified community health workers, you know, what's interesting, they started out as volunteers, Lee, because they want to help their community. Then I got a little grant, I could give them a little stipend. And, uh, and uh, then we got a little bigger grant. And then I brought them on as hourly workers at the university. And now Mike, I just got another little one to bring Mike to full time. Now he's full time. But I have him deployed in the barbershop. We need to think creatively. Think about this, as a full-time employee of the University of Maryland, he's got benefits, tuition benefits. His kids can go to Maryland with reduced tuition. That can change his life in the trajectory of his children's lives. Let's get creative, people. We need to go into these communities seeking their wisdom, not just telling them their problems. They know their problems. What they're trying to figure out is why we don't help them solve their problems. Uh, earlier in the slide deck, you saw the actual photograph of this scene on the left. So we've taken our images, our photographs. We have an artist that we work with. He turns them into these um, charcoal drawings. 
and we're now working on producing a, a graphic novel that will engage the community in ways that reading a CDC brochure won't. And when they see themselves in the images, they guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna take it home. They're gonna say, look at this. And vicariously, the whole family is learning. We have to recognize different learning styles that people have. And, um, and I've given a whole lot of trouble since I took you into a barbershop if I don't take you into the salon. And so I'm going to now show you how Katrina turned her salon into a COVID vaccine clinic. And, uh, and so here we go. You know, one thing about Zoom, when it puts that, um, uh, let me do it like this. It covers up what I need. There we go. at the shop okay uh do we have full screen lee are we good we're good okay very good okay scholars here's katrina buckle your seatbelt. welcome to shots at the shop and today we're at katrina's tray shades hair studio in capitol heights maryland which been amazing my favorite part is um, saving lives, seeing people get vaccinated because a lot of people are hesitant to get vaccinated. So if I can advocate and encourage them, I'm excited to do so. A lot of people just don't trust the system. So we have to take the time to answer their questions. And what better place to do that than in a place they already trust? They can dispel some myths and um, misinformation that's out there and then they can refer them to others with you know, more specific questions. I've honestly seen about 25 to 30 of my clients go from, no, I'm not getting that vaccine, to sure, I'll get vaccinated or show up at your clinic on Monday. I got my vaccination. Well, I was comfortable with coming here. I actually feel comfortable here than I would at a normal clinic. I like it because this is, I know this place is not like it's strange, it's not strange or anything. You truly are barbers and stylists, a trusted voice in the community. And we wanna tap into your expertise and be a good community partner. It's just for us to be knowledgeable in these health disparities so that we can have conversations behind our chair because I believe that we're more than just a hairstylist. We're touching people just like doctors and nurses do. Any barbershop that wants to hold a vaccine clinic in their place of business will find you a clinical partner. So we can bring in all the clinical expertise. I say, just do it. Just work on saving lives. Keep um, advocating for the community, bringing more people in. And I do believe that having a vaccine clinic at a salon is, is well worth it. It worked here at Trey Shades and it could work in your barbershop or beauty salon as well. Yes, son, you're fully vaccinated. It was a great day. <laughs> All right, all right. Come on now, let's give, show Katrina some love, show her some love. I am telling you, you talk about convincing people. She knows she doesn't have to solve it all at once because you know what? I'm going to see them again. And the next time they sit in my chair. <laughs> so Lee, I have literally seen Katrina do a, a interview with a reporter uh, while she's doing someone's hair and the person in the chair is listening, obviously. And by the time the interview's over, a conversion. The person in the chair says, where can I get vaccinated? In the clinics, we have people who show up hesitant. But guess what? They also leave hesitant, but vaccinated. We didn't have to convince them that the you know, world wasn't flat. We didn't have to argue about gravity. We didn't have to change worldview or political affiliation. We just treated them with dignity and respect. And when you come to our events at the barbershop, it's not like coming to a hospital or a clinic. You saw the DJ there, you just didn't hear the music. We're spinning music, we got the barbecue going. You're coming to a party. <laughs> and that whole atmosphere creates calm. And in that moment, we can help people make an informed decision. 
I'm going to head to the finish line because I can't wait to talk to this audience. And I'm going to show you uh, recent work in the field. Lee, did we get back to the slides? We good? Okay. Uh, we went to the 25th anniversary, uh, the African American Cultural Festival. And here we are out in, a, in the courtyard, out in front of the court building in Towson, Maryland. And we put up a health pavilion, a tent, and a pop up barbershop. And 10 feet away, the health department put the vaccine clinic. And as you can see, people were getting vaccinated, people were getting their hair done. And we were asking, answering their questions. And we have a board here, as you can say, I got my COVID vac vaccine because I want your audience to think of that. If you're vaccinated out there, why? What was your motivation? What was your motivation? And when we uh, put the post-its on a board and categorized them into themes, um, it's amazing what we found. Family, family, do you see your motivation in here? Family was a big reason people, my mom told me to, hey mothers, any mothers out there? What are you telling your kids? Lee, you should know that for the children uh, 12 and up, some of them are living in households where the adults in the house are opposed to the vaccine. And the young person is faced with overcoming that if possible. Family matters. They want to stay safe. They don't want to get sick. They don't want to die. Do you see your motivation up here? And the third theme, I want to keep my community safe. Isn't that interesting? My family, myself, and my community. Here's what strikes me. They're telling us what their motivations are. But when I look at the literature and a lot of the material I see, I don't see these themes <laughs> being elevated as levers to move the needle. So by, again, going to the people, meeting them where they are, doing our, our, our research, our, our qualitative research, we can design tailored interventions co-created with the community. Okay, then last Friday, literally, last Friday, we were in Baltimore City, in one of the toughest neighborhoods in the city, the neighborhood where Freddie Gray was arrested and, and later died, and, and then all the riot and everything that happened afterwards. That's where we were. Now, look at the images around the screen. Tell me what you see. In the upper left, that's the stylist whose shop we were in. She's raising her hands because she got vaccinated and her daughter. Okay, so I'm looking at people who could have been vaccinated months ago, getting it for the first time. Every arm counts. We walk the streets and we talk to people. As we walk the streets, look where the lady has her arms up, abandoned buildings, boarded up buildings all around, litter all around. I can tell you my students had a little anxiety as they witnessed the suffering in real time in the middle of the day, including open, open, well, we'll talk about it during the discussion. Now look in the lower right. If we had time, I'd, we, we, would, we would deconstruct that, Lee, but right near the wall, you see that? You see a can? two pop cans, some litter, and a hypodermic needle. We saw this all over the neighborhood. And my students say to me, Dr. T, if we see this, why doesn't the whoever's supposed to fix this see it? And, 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 and that's why they're in school, <laughs> because it's complicated. <laughs> but the most important thing is when we stopped and engaged people in conversationally, they embraced us because we didn't judge them. We didn't look down on them. We asked them their opinions and we listened. And we had an amazing vaccine clinic. Now that bus there is the city uh, health department's community outreach bus. But what a sign. Look at that image in the upper right. The liquor stores there 
open seven days a week. <laughs> but my but my public health mobile unit's only there, you know, every now and then, if ever. We've got to be as engaging as a liquor store, meeting people right there where they need. We've got to get much more creative. And so when we looked at the word cloud from this event, yes, you still see family over there on the right. You still see uh, self uh, there in the pink in the lower right. Um, this was new, the principle around the right thing to do and faith in God. We need to unpack that a little more. But it's this in the upper left. We had not seen in any of our other events, death. They were motivated because my brother died. My sister died. My brother's friend died. I almost died. Boy, it's getting real close then. If you have to wait that long, it's getting real close. It doesn't have to be this way. And so as I close, I just want you to know that we have hope. Uh, we've seen evidence that we can move the needle. Uh, my university uh, is committed to doing a better job in community engagement and in training our scholars to be able to do work in communities uh, and to do their scholarship in science in ethical ways. And it's very important that we uh, recognize some of the dangers. And one of them is the danger is to assume that racism is not relevant to the scientific pursuit of solutions for elimination of health disparities. It is very re relevant. And we now have a growing body of scientific literature demonstrating that racism actually gets under your skin. Take a, a look at some of that literature on infant mortality in African-American women. The danger is to assume that some populations will always suffer from premature illness and death by virtue of their culture bound lifestyles. That part of Baltimore, I could pick any town. I'm just using it because you were just there with me. And someone would drive through and say, look at this degradation. That's how they live. There's nothing we can do about that. Who are we to go in and tell them what to do? That's a cop out. They are our neighbors. And number three, that the elimination of disparities is impossible and health equity unachievable in a free market society. If we don't figure this out, nobody's going to be free. And that's what an infectious disease teaches you. We, th we were spiking the ball in the 30-yard line, Lee, when we thought we were out of this, and then Delta came, okay? Nobody's out of this unless everybody's out of this. And that's not just in the U.S., that's the world. There's less than less than 3% of of populations in Africa have been have been vaccinated. So we could get another variant that can bypass the vaccines we currently have if we're not careful. We have to vaccinate the world and we have to vaccinate our uh, community as well. And guess what? We're Americans. We can do both. We must do both. And with that, I'm going to say thank you. Turn the floor back to our sponsors and and open up for some discussion. And uh, again, thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much. Dr. Thomas, I'd like to thank you on behalf of Indiana University South Bend, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and our own civil rights Heritage Center here at IU South Bend, where we all believe in the power of community engagement, which means we need to turn to the Q&A portion of the evening. We have 15 minutes and we're going to alternate back and forth between the Zoom audience and our in-person audience. Dr. Bill Ferry is going to handle the Zoom audience and I want to also introduce Dr. Lee Kahn back up to the podium, um, who's gonna help us with the in-person portion of the event. Thank you. Dr. Ferry, go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks. That was a great, great uh, and very informative talk. Thanks very much, Dr. Thomas. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, we have a question in the, in the Zoom, uh, basically saying that uh, a large number of people are not getting the vaccine, saying that it, it's their body, so their choice, and that uh, mandating vaccination restricts uh, their freedom. Uh, but it really is a question of public health. So why doesn't or why can't the federal government mandate vaccination for all residents? 
Well, um, that's a very, very good question. And you might remember when, uh, before mandates were talked about, we were doing our best, right? We were trying to convince people. You know, I actually think, I actually think we, we scientists, academics thought, wasn't it once we get a vaccine, I see light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to get a vaccine. It's going to be approved and it's safe and effective. And then we got the vaccine. And all of a sudden, things got really politicized. And so the persuasion, as, as, as best we could, but this is, a, this is a pandemic. These are the kinds of things that change societies. We could not risk this getting out of hand and another variant. You want another miracle? They have to come up with another set of vaccines to solve a, a variant that can beat the ones we have? We couldn't take that chance. And all of a sudden, I just say this, what's the big deal about mandates? Uh, I'm looking at uh, you, my friend. Don't you remember when we lined up to get that polio vaccine? Whether we got the scratch on the back of the arm or took it orally? We all lined up as one community because it was to save us as a community. And uh, so vaccines are not new. Why, why make this so, such like a different thing? And the politicalization is part of the dynamic and the fragmentation of where people get information. And unfortunately, the erosion of trust in our scientific institutions and in our academic institutions. So um, the government is mandating where they can, but they've also looked to private industry I'm not going to go to a restaurant if, I, if I'm not going to be safe. I'm not going to go to a concert if I don't feel I'm safe. Uh, and, but look at the pockets in the country where they're going to huge events and no masks, no social distance. And so, again, America always does the right thing after we do everything else. We're still in the doing everything else mode. Um, the other thing that we're hearing uh, is this issue around infertility. There has never been an issue around infertility. It is actually recommended that pregnant women get vaccinated because you can protect your unborn child that way. Why wouldn't we have the, the, the right to life groups all behind this? Because we increase the likelihood that a child will be born COVID free or at least protected. We've got to figure out how to talk across our differences without being disagreeable to one another. And I think that there's no better place to practice that than on a college campus. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Um, let's take a question from the in-person audience and please state your name. Um, I'll have to repeat your question uh, to him because uh, only the uh, microphone can be heard. So yes. So Stephen, Catherine wants to know, she's a health sciences student, and uh, she wants to know what um, up and coming health professionals can do to um, make a difference um, in uh, the communities that you're talking about. Um, well, I think that you have more power than you think as students. You need to tell your faculty that at this moment, we are literally living through a pandemic. What you're doing in your profession is preparing you for a moment such as this. So now you don't have to just look in the book. You can actually go out and see it in real time. <laughs> and we need to have it structured. And so coursework that allows our students to have a structured way of engaging the community and not just out there on their own. Uh, we have dynamics here on our own campus where there's hundreds of activities going on in the community, but they're not coordinated. And here's what happens. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Reverend Lewis, who's on everybody's committee, who's on everybody's advisory board, Reverend Lewis is getting burned out. Reverend Lewis is tired. Reverend Lewis needs some coordination so that we're not overburdening the same groups. 
uh, here at the University of Maryland, we're going through a strategic planning process at the presidential level. And one of the main pillars is community engagement. I don't know what it is, but I think there's a realization that as academic institutions, we must be better tied to our, um, to our neighbors. And it's unfortunate that you can look at some of the most prestigious medical institutions, uh, academic medical science institutions in the country and draw a two mile radius around their campus and see some of the worst health statistics in the country. And, and, and you'll see the US News and World Report banners, number one in this and number one in that. And, and the people I work with suffering from the very things you say you're number one in. So as students, you need to step up and say, we want better engagement you can take us out into the community or you can bring the community onto our campus. It goes both ways. And we're hearing that from our students here. I teach a course in human-centered design and the entire course is focused on designing solutions for community problems and working with the community to co-create those solutions. And uh, it's now over a hundred students have been through that program. You know what's interesting uh, when they say, um, would you write a letter of recommendation for me? I said, you're a senior, you took this elective. Why are you asking me? <laughs> they said, well, when I was doing my interview for medicine, medical school, and I just happened to mention this class, every question afterwards was about the class. How did you engage the community? What skills did you learn? Uh, what lessons can you bring to this job? I thought that was fascinating. I think there's a realization around the country that we have to figure a way of coming back together and not be isolated in the ivory tower, not be perceived as, as eggheads, not be perceived as they label us. You know, our articles usually begin with this, the statement of the problem, our grant proposals, the statement of the problem. I can tell you if I would let the, some of the community read those early statement of the problem, they'd say, why are you trashing the neighborhood? <laughs> Even the, even the images I just showed you with, with hypodermic needles and, and litter, that's somebody's home, that's somebody's neighborhood, and they want to get it back. So I think you need to speak up as students, and I think your faculty will respond. You have more power than you think. Bill, do you have a question from our online audience? Yes, we have several. Um, so uh, first one here is uh, in our country, we see vaccine hesitancy among urban blacks and Hispanics, but also uh, rural conservatives. So Ron Victor taught me about barbershops, but I'm wondering if you have insights related to addressing uh, COVID vaccine resistance among uh, along the political divide. You know, that's a really, really interesting one. And I, you know, just like if you came uh, into my neighborhood, I'd take you into the barbershops. I'd be coming to South Bend saying, hey, take me into the rural areas. I'm trying to find someone to take me into Appalachia. I want to go, but I need a guide. And therein lies the key. We need guides. So uh, if you're out West, you might be uh, doing your intervention at, at the feed store where all the guy, all, all they all come in and buy their seeds there and, and use, and then the rodeos. And, and, and let me just say this, I could do that because I've been on a cattle drive. I got the whole outfit. I could show up authentic as a black cowboy and they would embrace me. My point is how do we talk across our difference? I think we do it by not no shame, no blame. And there's a lot of that going on right now. I remember when the Alabama governor said, it's all about those unvaccinated people. They're the ones holding us back. And as soon as you do that, now now, now we got our, our, our hair on the back of our neck up. Now we're ready to fight. I think we simply have to find new ways of coming together. And it's difficult in a pandemic. We, you, we would come together to break bread, to eat together. We would come together. Uh, but we're under these restrictions that makes it very difficult. So here's what we've learned. Zoom works. Our community partners, uh, some of them with phones that only make phone calls, have figured out how to be on Zoom. And we've been bringing them into Zoom rooms with all these scientists and they can have their concerns um, uh, heard and hopefully addressed. How do we use this technology to have better engagement with our communities. And when we find that they need help out there to get their 
systems up and running so they can connect to the 21st century, that will be a positive good, a positive good, because the future will be more online registrations for vaccines, online registrations for your medical portal. Many of you out there have these portals. During COVID, you probably used it more than you did before. So that is the future. How do we bring telewellness into these neighborhoods? We, 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 can, we do uh, 60 minute shows about bringing telemedicine to some remote island somewhere in the world. Well, let's just bring it right across the street in the neighborhoods. That's possible too. So let's begin to think about what's possible and ask ourselves, how might we, how might we not, it's too big, not it's too costly, but how might we solve this problem together? We have a question from our in-person audience. Yes, ma'am in the back. So um, we have a comment from Dr. Barbara Williams, who says she finds it interesting that um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm getting your uh, statement correct, that um, historically barbershops were a place where um, uh, people received misinformation. Is that what you said? No, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. That it's interesting that that was a place that the barbershops were a place where medicine was practiced historically, and now that we've now we've returned to it uh, as a place <laughs> for um, uh, uh, medical practice. You know uh, that, that that you are absolutely right, um, and it's again the other thing we have to deal with this is this these hierarchies we have right. Uh, we could trace the origins of, of dentistry and oral surgery and other kinds of surgeries to the barbershop. Uh, but you'd be hard pressed to find a highly respected surgeon today to say he has his roots there. Okay. <laughs> so we shun these things, unfortunately. And uh, uh, for my African American uh, historian in the audience, you know what's interesting? In the great migration out of the South, described best in the book, The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson. That's the largest migration in history of this country. That was Black people moving out of the South. They came North for freedom and they found discrimination. So they had to fend for themselves. At the top of the pecking order was the minister. Next to the minister was the barber. Isn't that interesting? And here's another very interesting fact back in the day. Uh, the book is called cutting along the color line. Like back in the time of de Tocqueville, when he came to America, they would see these barber shops. You ready for this? These black barbers, they only served wealthy white men. That's how they became the business. They didn't become a business cutting their own hair, their neighbor's hair. You could do that at home <laughs> in the backyard. They only serve wealthy white men. No self-respecting white businessman back in that day would ever let another white man shave him or cut his hair. It was a sign of power that you could put a razor in the hands of a former slave or a descendant and not walk away with your, with your throat cut. It was a sign of power. And then guess what? These businessmen are doing what in the barbershop smoking cigars and talking business what do you think those black barbers are doing listening and learning and then the bonds form and this white businessman says hey joe how long have you been written this place i'm gonna help you buy this building literally help them buy buildings literally help them get members of their family out of slavery it's an amazing story as the immigrants arrived, the Italians, the Irish, the German, many came, they weren't white. They weren't white when they got there. I got some Irish out there. Come on, you know some of that history. 
And he said, how are these black former slaves running these businesses with these elite business people? They were jealous. Um, let's come up with a city regulation on, on what, uh, having a license to be a barber. Okay, now we come up with all the regulations, have to go to training, and all of a sudden, um, as these ethnic communities formed and formed barbershops and, and whites began to drift away, the black barbers said, okay, I'm going to bring a white German barber in here. But none of the patrons would go to the white German uh, barber. But over time, as soon as they brought black people into the barbershop, that was the beginning of the end because of issues around segregation. And so we now think of the black barbershop. But what you need to know is that not, that is not how it started. And, and increasingly, I'm seeing young white uh, uh, men in particular come into traditional black barbershops. Why? They're part of the hip hop generation. They love the music. It feels authentic. And uh, I think that's a good thing because I know they won't be afraid the next time they walk down the street and see a black person walking towards them. It's very interesting. I think it can be very healing. And I think we can bring mental health services and other kinds of services into these settings and really make a difference. And so um, I, um, I'm encouraged. And uh, I think that this humble place has moved from the margins to the mainstream. And if we can get sufficient support, we can scale this around the country and create a new home for healthcare that has a barbershop story. That's not second-class healthcare. Did you see that hospital president in that video? It was like a light bulb went off in her head when she realized what we were able to accomplish. She says, I want to come here for your wisdom. I want a new relationship between my hospital system and the community, and this is a good place to start. Nobody would question going to churches. We do that. But everybody doesn't go to church. And the one thing about these black barbershops is that you'll have a, a sitting judge, an actual sitting judge next to the guy who works on the loading dock at Walmart, next to the unemployed guy, next to the homeless guy, okay? And you, how many places can you see that kind of gathering? That is the magic of these spaces, these sacred spaces. I want Indiana to be part of the solution. Do I have some help out there? I want you to sign up with, with, with the organizers and see what we can do right there in Indiana. And I'm going to look over the White House list and see what barbershops and salons that we already have signed up in Indiana and uh, see how we can work together and have your students engaged in some of the work that might be going on right around the corner from your university. Bill, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, uh, in that case, I am going to combine two that are are, are, are similar. Uh, so first, uh, people are saying it was a fantastic presentation. Uh, great to see the action that's being involved. And so the combined question is, how difficult was it to establish the part partnership between the university uh, and the health community to deliver vaccines. And the second part would be, how would we go about getting a program like Shots at the Shop uh, to be part of our community? Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was very difficult. And yet it was self-evident. You gotta spend the time. So the difficult part for me was uh, as a faculty, a uh, member of the faculty, to be out in these barbershops and salons and to have my peer faculty say, what are you doing? You're never going to get promoted and tenure doing that. Uh, that's service. That's not science. You know, I had to fight through all of that. Okay. Um, but once we got it going, and like I say, when I brought the dean of the School of Pharmacy in, it's like a light bulb went off. And so we have just consistently been uh, working to understand these spaces. I will send uh, uh, the organizers a list of the actual scientific articles that we uh, published working with the barbers, including um, a collection of, of uh, DNA. And I noticed that um, Professor Bender uh, 
worked in the area of genetics. I think he'd find it quite interesting, our ability to collect microbiome and DNA in a barbershop. Uh, our work uh, looking at air quality uh, with our environmental health scientists, we put in air monitors in a salon, randomly selected uh, stylists uh, in those um, facilities and measured their exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals in the products they use through their urine. Okay, so here's a bio sample I'm collecting in a barbershop, <laughs> okay? And the work we're doing right now to provide weekly saliva COVID tests uh, to the barbers and stylists, you can't do what they do six feet away. We want them to, and if they're not working, they're not eating. And so they'll take the risk. Uh, we want to make these places as safe as possible. And then our work with Dr. Don Milton on bringing in ultraviolet light into these uh, spaces so that we can have barbershops that are safe. And so uh, I, I, think it's, I, I think it's a moment that time has come. You saw the randomized cluster randomized trial that I showed you in New England Journal. You know, the unfortunate model is we do something like that, then we go in and move on to another topic in this, you know, my point is we've got to get to scaling some of these things and I think that's possible and that our universities are a very important part of making that possible. And our students are a tremendous workforce uh, to, to help them do that and to leave something of value behind, something that's more than just a detailed, precise description of their suffering. We have to leave behind solutions and we have to bring what we hear in the community back to our universities. Uh, Lee, I have to give the community, when I'm first out there, it's the 45 minutes to be told off. I said, I wasn't here then. It doesn't matter. You're from the university and all the bad things that happened before, I have to listen to, accept, and say, we're going to do things better. And I think that's where we are right now. How do we do things better? How do we bring back a conversation on the common good? And how do we use the bioethical principle of justice to bring about justice in healthcare? Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Thomas. Uh, uh, our our guests appreciate your answers to those <laughs> questions. <laughs> I'm going to miss those snacks, those South Bend snacks coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're, you're queuing it up for me. Um, uh, thanks again um, from, uh, from the in-person house here. It was an uh, incredibly thought-provoking talk. Uh, thanks for being so generous with your time. Um, let's give him one last round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And for the family members, the Bender family members out there, thank you. Your, your parents paid it forward. They too are touching eternity. Um, we, um, we do have a reception after the lecture. Um, we want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Um, both of those of you uh, in the Joshi Performance Hall and those of you online. Um, unfortunately, we can't feed those of you online. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, we hope those of you that are here in person will um, join us outside for some refreshments and uh, uh, to talk about Dr. Thomas's uh, thrilling lecture tonight. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope Bye. to see you in person one day soon. Bye-bye.